I'm going to really talk about really the high level of what the two ports uh, have, have accomplished over the, over the course of the last <coughs> 10 years, specifically our partnership in the development of the Clean Air Action Plan uh, in, in 2006. Um, a lot of that came out of leadership. Uh, uh, Laura Cordero in the back, she, she didn't mention, but her husband was a former uh, harbor finisher for Long Beach for eight years. Uh, he was what, what I'll call the godfather of our green port policy. <coughs> And he's always telling me to be a leader. And every time I see him, lead, be a leader. And um, that's exactly what he did when he was on the commission. And that was a, it was a tough time. Um, and he had to be a leader to, to influence, uh, to influence uh, where we needed to be uh, to, to stay competitive and be sustainable. And you have to evolve in, in, in coming up with um, policies and commitment. And that's exactly what the two courts have done over the course of the last 10 years. And part of that commitment also is, is finding innovation, being innovative and being, uh, thinking about the future. And I, uh, Rose, uh, who's part of my team, uh, works uh, collaboratively on our technology advancement program, a very successful program. And what I like about Port Tech is that it's, it is an incubator. It's a starting point. It, it does help facilitate um, a lot of um, opportunities and then once those opportunities are formed and are ready for demonstration that's where we have that opportunity at the ports through our technology advancement program so I just wanted to highlight that again and, and thank uh, John and Stan and, and Ann for, for inviting me to speak here um, I think Stan did a good job to cover this we're the number two port we're okay being number two <laughs> all right and I'm not going to comment about this joint port thing. Because, uh, <laughs> my, my talking points uh, uh, that I've just been uh, received from our communication director, which is no comment. <laughs> so, uh, there's been some stuff in the paper. I'll let the leaders uh, handle that one. Um, we are the number two port uh, in the nation in terms of the overall containers. We do more than containers. And I think uh, what John was just describing in terms of just the vessel mix is, is very important. And it is important to understand uh, who our customers are and, and what they do and what their future business is going to look like. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the Panama Canal and the effects of Panama Canal, what that's going to do. Um, you know, I, I, I have to tell you, the Panama Canal is whatever it's, it has, whatever it was going to do, it's already happened. Um, you know, what we need to do here in San Peter Bay is, is think about our future uh, and, and being competitive. And, and that's a lot of what the two ports are doing right now in terms of investing. Uh, Port of Long Beach is investing over $4 billion in the next uh, uh, six, seven years um, just in infrastructure, a new bridge. Uh, we're, we're building that uh, new jail desert bridge, which is a vital asset to this nation uh, in connecting boat ports and moving cargo, um, as well as uh, our marine terminal operations dredging. Uh, you know, we're providing the infrastructure of the future so we can handle the, the new vessels, cleaner vessels that we're calling, or will be calling. Uh, Huge job, creative, uh, nationwide. Uh, there's a there's actually a map that we use when we go to D.C. to explain to you know the, the congressman from you know um, Wichita uh, why why ports are important, why the Port of Long Beach and, and Los Angeles are important because it creates jobs in his neighborhood as well, and what he should be thinking about what's important when it comes to. Uh, ports and goods movement and freight. And there's a big discussion happening right now at the national level and the state level as it relates to freight. And it's important and because uh, this is all part of uh, transportation money. And um, you know, in the past, uh, ports it haven't been clearly put into uh, that, that type of a dialogue. And so what, what we're starting to see now is we're getting that message out there, the importance of ports. And it's important to have um, <coughs> Port's part of the system, and we need to have opportunities to, to get those funds so that we can be competitive and we can move cargo efficiently um, and in a more sustainable way. And so there's a big discussion that's happening right now, and both ports are very active in that, uh, as well as our respective cities and, and a lot of other stakeholders. Uh, at the state level, there's also a discussion happening uh, with the California Air Resources Board about um, a sustainable freight strategy. Uh, and a lot of this is starting to dovetail into a lot of the things the two ports have done over the course of the last 10 years. Um, talk about our green port policy. This is it. This is our foundation. This is what is guiding us in terms of 
uh, having a balance within our business about being a sustainable operation. Um, there's, we have six pillars in here, and there's two vital pillars. One that's probably the most vital that I believe in, and that's our community engagement. And that was what the, the two ports, and I'll speak for the two ports in this case, because we, we, we have to learn a hard lesson, uh, because for many years, our port complex was very isolated. Uh, a lot of the communities, member residents in the communities worked in the ports. <coughs> but as the port started to transform into not being in being what it is today in terms of containers, uh, as well as the, the growth of the imports from, from Asia, uh, these two ports were in a reactive mode. And so, you know, we were focused on how we're gonna accommodate that cargo that's coming in for this nation and ignoring those impacts on our communities. And so that really is what drove uh, our port as well as the Port of Los Angeles to really develop uh, in, in 2005, uh, the, the dialogue started the development of a cleaner action plan. Uh, we've had an update in, 20, in 2010. Uh, the first version of the cleaner action plan focused on near term. And uh, one of the first priorities that we all decided at that time was we need to get at the trucks because the trucks were uh, going through the neighborhoods and had the most impacts when it came to health. And so I think we've been very successful with our partners uh, and, and in transforming uh, a, a, a truck fleet in a matter of four years, in fact, three years. And a lot of that was, was done by industry. Um, the ports established the foundation. Uh, we, we provided the guidance. Uh, we set the bar. Um, we're not a regulatory agency. We don't, we don't set standards. Um, but what we do is we develop the program and use some mechanisms that we have to, to be able to get to changing out our, our truck fleet. Um, it's a very dynamic uh, truck program. Um, we know exactly, both ports know exactly what truck, when it's entering a gate, when it's leaving the gate, how many times it calls on the 24. I could, I could send an email right now and get a list of all the activity from yesterday. And that's important, and that's a, a data set that helps guide us with, with a lot of our programs. Uh, we have about 1,000 um, uh, LNG trucks that are uh, LNG, CNG, uh, alternative fuel uh, trucks that are part of the fleet. Once again, that's, that's vital when it comes to another uh, reduction in diesel particulate matter. Um, and that's exactly why that program, as well as some other programs I want to talk about, um, have, have gotten us to these numbers. One of the things that uh, has been important for the ports uh, when we first launched the interaction plan is we had to develop a baseline. Our baseline is 2005. We need to have that metric. We need to be able to grade ourselves and understand as we move forward with uh, these programs and implementing them, where are we, where should our priorities be? Um, are these programs getting the emission reductions that we have predicted uh, in, in the estimates? And or do we need to make, make some modifications and or reprioritize where our dollars should be going uh, to continue to make the progress we've made? Um, these numbers are very consistent with Port of Los Angeles. I don't know if Carter's got any numbers, but both ports are fundamentally in the, in the same range in terms of emission reductions. Um, many of the programs that we have, uh, we definitely work together. Some are very joint. Um, <coughs> some we do independently. Um, for instance, our, our, we have a green ship incentive program. Um, we work together with the goals and, and the objectives, but we just have different frameworks. But at the end of the day, it's the same objectives, which is get the cleanest and greenest ships in here in its incentive program. One of the key things, and I was just given a, a discussion, a uh, presentation in, in Baltimore. I was invited to uh, uh, participate in, a, in an EPA summit, a sports initiative summit. Uh, headquarters in EPA and DC is starting to launch and rethink um, uh, ports and, and, and from a clean air strategy standpoint. Um, it's not the first time they've done it, um, but it was an interesting because there was a lot of <coughs> stakeholders and I was able to provide our success story. We're an outlier. We're an outlier when it comes to the impacts, the activity we do, and our success for, for our programs. A lot of the other sports don't need to do what we, we're doing or at the level we're doing or how we do it. And so that's something that I think is important for our industry and that we don't have a regulatory body who wants to do one size fits all. One of the things that's, that's key in our clean air action plan is is that we have strategies in there, and then we have a variety of implementation mechanisms. Clean trucks program, we used our tariff. 
it was kind of a command and control type of, a, of, a, of an implementation strategy. We have a variety of incentive programs, voluntary incentive programs. Um, and others, um, you know, we use, we use different implementation mechanisms. So it's, it's important, that was my message to a lot of the stakeholders and the EPA and to some of the other uh, NGOs that are popping up around uh, and have, um, have concerns at other ports in the nation. Um, and so it's important that, you know, once again, I think we've been successful with a model and uh, what I don't want to do is have, you know, Big Brother and DC try to play around with us a little bit because, you know, they need to redefine the role. Um, collaboration, I think it's critical. Uh, that's what's made us successful in, in, in the results of the, the emission reductions that we've seen. Um, we have a partner. We have partners in the, in the regulatory agencies. US EPA is a partner here at Green Army. They have been from day one uh, when it came to our development of our Clean Air Action Plan. Uh, California Air Resource Support, as well as the uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District. Um, and they are um, a, a, a very vital, they have a role, a distinct role, uh, when it comes to the Clean Air Act and, and what their duties are. And a lot of what we've developed in our Clean Air Action Plans and our forecasting is lining up for attainment. We have a severe non-attainment non here when it comes to air quality and meeting. Uh, federal standards, and uh, we've lined up where we need to be, and, and from our sources, reports, and, and that gets rolled up to the state, and eventually uh, lining up where the state needs to be for meeting attainment in the future. Um, so it's very quantitative uh, in terms of what we do, how we monitor, and how it's linked into what works are here. We're part of a system, we're part of a region, and uh, that's a lot of, of what, why it's important, and educating, and and is another critical piece when it comes to our success. Educating the community and a lot of our stakeholders about what we can do and when we can do it, or what we need. And I think a lot of you in this room, we need that innovation. We need people to be able to find solutions in a cost-effective way and get things on the market so that we have um, options, or our customers have options to meeting. Uh, our goals. Talk about our Clean Start Pro Trucks program, very successful. There's a lot of information on that. Um, we have a vessel uh, speed reduction program that's been very successful. In fact, this probably uh, predates the uh, Clean Air Action Plan. Uh, both ports um, have a version of this. I believe yours is tied into your, your green ship. Right? That's separate. So, oh, it is, okay. Um, Anyways, both ports have, we, we have <coughs> individual programs. Uh, we incentivize uh, vessels to slow down as they're approaching uh, the, the port complex. And we have a 20 mile and a 40 nautical mile uh, uh, incentive uh, rebate, not a rebate, but a, uh, they get a, a wharf reduction. And we call it certain terms we can't use because our lawyer will get, all, get upset. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, a lawyer, there's, there's some lawyers in here, right? I gotta be careful. Um, our green ship program. Um, yeah, John did a good job talking about ships. Um, we've been very fortunate. Uh, this is one of the, the largest contributors when it comes to air emissions. When we have a pie chart, it's, it's about 50, 55 percent of total emissions now and in the future we project it. And that's from all vessels, container plus the non-container. Um, the green ship really is focused on containers and getting the, 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 the greenest and, and, the, and the most advanced uh, ships to call our port and to influence uh, our customers and the, and the vessel liners to, to bring those new vessels that they're buying right now that are on books or in the yard right now and get them into the rotation here in San Diego Bay. Um, it's a long-term program. Um, you know, be honest with you, I don't think our incentive is going to overly influence them. There's a lot of other decisions that are that are made when uh, vessel liners uh, move ships into rotations into, into services. Um, but we do believe, though, it will help. Uh, and you know, over time, we may have to make some adjustments. We're fortunate also that we have international standards. There was what's called the IMO uh, Annex Six that was was put in place at an international level before. That was in place. The two ports really had a struggle. We had a challenge. How are we going to address uh, cleaning up the vessels that call our ports? Uh, and there's a legacy fleet, and 
there's going to be new, just like you have new cars and everything else and things change over time, there's a legacy fleet. These are assets that, you know, these customers are not just going to go and, and trade in. They don't have that type of ability to market and they have to get a rate of return on their investment. And so we're fortunate that at international level that we're going to see cleaner and newer ships with standards internationally. And there's what's also came out, it's called the Emission Control Area, the ECA. Um, and that helps with our port complex be competitive because it allows us to have a fair playing field. Uh, so other ports who don't maybe have a cleaner action plan, um, they're also going to have those clean ships. And it's not going to be one port pitted against another port in terms of having different standards when it comes to international vessels. So this is very key for our, for our um, success. Uh, moving forward in our business and being sustainable because we won't be the only port that's requiring ships to be clean. Um, so that also helps industry. It helps industry probably uh, progress in a, in a much sooner uh, way than they otherwise would. Uh, cold ironing is another one of our strategies. This is a state requirement now, but this was one of the original strategies that came out of the Cleaner Action Plan before it was a requirement. And both ports were very successful in working with CARP to develop what we feel is a meaningful regulation. Uh, our vessels, our customers don't really like it, um, but it's critical uh, because it gets at capturing emissions from auxiliary engines while vessels are at birth. Now, it's only for container, and it's a, it's a phased in approach. But we also, you know, through our technology advancement program, we also want to have the ability to have alternatives, cost-effective alternatives. Um, we also want to have the ability to figure out how we can maybe capture the unregulated vessels out there and get more emission reductions. Uh, cold ironing is not cost effective for vessels that only call maybe once every two years here. And that's like the bulk, the transit, these, these charter vessels that, you know, um, are the non-container. And, uh, you know, they, they may call twice a year uh, at the port complex or we may not see them for three years. Um, and so, when they do come, we want to be able to have an alternative to capture those emissions while they're here in a cost effective way. And so we are in the process of working and partnering with our quality management district as well as uh, with, uh, with ACTI, who's a vendor who's, who's developed the, the, the quote unquote sock in the stack. I don't have a sock anymore, it's a direct connect system. But they've did, been successful on a phase one demonstration at our Pure G dry bulk facility, um, and they're going through a process with CARB to get verification. And what we're doing is doing a phase two uh, barge mounted unit, uh, taking the unit off the dock and putting it on a barge to demonstrate that on container terminal, on container vessels. Uh, so this is something we're, we're, we're very, very promising. It's been a lot of commitment and, and a lot of time that's been spent on this. But this is important. It's important because we need flexibility and, and we need to have these, these, these type of options. And this is, this is once again, this kind of goes back into, you know, there's a concept and this is a concept that was started over 10 years ago. And uh, ACTI is, is committed to this, and they put a lot of resources into it. And they've had to go through a process. And I think there's been lessons learned. But I think that's why I think port tech is important, too, because I think you can probably get that foundation and get things lined up in a way. So when we get ready for maybe advancing your technology in our world at the port, you know, it, it, it's not seamless, but you, you <coughs> You kind of are ready to go to that next step, commercialization, verification, things like that. Technology advancement program, talked about this. It's a staple of our cleaner action plan. Um, examples uh, uh, that have come out of this is, is working with FOSS Maritime, uh, uh, Millennium as well. I think we have uh, Rose, or we have a couple with a the, the, the hybrid tub. And then the retro, right? And then so there's a variety of uh, technology uh, demonstrations that we're doing, both on vessels and harbor craft and uh, uh, cargo handling equipment. Um, and there's a lot of information. You can talk to Rose, uh, Port of Los Angeles. Um, once again, this is a collaborative approach. We actually have one of the keys for this is we have an advisory board that is made up of uh, EPA, CARB, and South Coast Air Quality Management District. Because that's the whole, what our goal is, is to demonstrate and get these technologies verified or certified. That's not going to come from sports. We don't do that. Um, we let the agencies do that. And um, 
So once again, that's why it's critical. Uh, they're part of it, and uh, we get the we get these things to market. Uh, ultimate goal: zero emissions. Um, this is goes back to my point about attainment. Um, we need to. We're we're in a, in, in, a, in a different world than other regions because of air quality, because of where we are, where the winds blow, uh, the magnitude of the urban center that we are. Um, and this region is going to need to get to near zero emissions when it comes to moving freight, um, when it comes to doing a lot of things. Uh, and, and so that kind of goes back into what the two ports have developed in, in, in a roadmap for zero emissions. Uh, for some of our sources, trucks, uh, rail, harbor craft, I mean, uh, harbor handling equipment. Um, and we've been successful in also uh, the two ports uh, demonstrating electric trucks. Balcon is one that uh, Port of Los Angeles has been very committed to. Um, and one of the things about demonstrations, and this is what I have to remind uh, my Board of Harbor Commissioners, when we present to them these opportunities, uh, a lot of times we're making a predict prediction about the success, the emission reductions, but I have to remind them we're demonstrating. Um, we're trying to collect information and there may be things we may modify and test again. Um, and the result may be it's not very successful and it's not going to meet the mark. And so our commitment and our, our money we're investing is to do that. It's not to get some return on that investment per se. The return on the investment is we're progressing the technology for our future. Energy. Uh, this is another big thing. There's a lot of little, little big topics popping up, but energy for us, because of where we're headed with a lot of our strategies uh, for for our environmental sustainability goals, is being dependent upon the electrical grid and also uh, for other systems. And so, because of things like San Onofre going down, for instance, um, it begs the question: Is that energy going to be available? Future for our future needs to keep this port running. Resiliency from a from a safety and and uh, from uh, you know the opportunity if there is a power outage or if there is a severe storm, uh, the experience that New York, New Jersey had in, in uh, Superstorm Sandy several years ago shut down the port for two weeks, and a lot of the problem was is they couldn't get they had they had no energy, uh, they had no electricity, they couldn't move any cargo. Um, they couldn't get gas to get the workers to, to the port, uh, and uh, you were even get gas to the generators to even do small amounts of, of activity. So what what the two ports have launched is is uh, moving forward with an energy policy and moving forward with energy uh, uh, planning, and lining that up for our future for our future, <laughs> so that we have cost effective uh, with, 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 from an environmental renewable side of it. Uh, from a cost effective for our terminal operators because now we're requiring the ships to plug in. So how do we find uh, some cost savings somewhere else in their operation because they're gonna have to pay a premium for that electricity at the dock, as well as the resiliency and the, and the reliability side of it. So there's there's many of you in the room here that um, probably have a lot of great ideas and, and uh, you know that's really gonna be lining up for our success and our sustainability in the future. Um, I've, uh, you know, where I see things going right now for us is um, I think we have a great foundation. You know, a lot of the discussion that we're starting to see now is ports being part of the system. Uh, and we can't be looked at as in isolation. I think we've done a great job in terms of reducing from sources, and now we have to talk about efficiencies in our systems and infrastructure. And that's going to help us when it comes to being more sustainable and having healthier communities around our ports and keeping us competitive, frankly. So with that, I want to thank you. And uh, 